Alrighty, Shabbat Shalom. Let's start in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne and we thank you and bless you for another week. We thank you for all the blessings that you bestow on us, your people. And we thank you, Father, for opening up our minds to your truth in these perilous end times that we live in. We thank you, Father, for sanctifying us from the world and we thank you for giving us the book of Revelation and revealing to us before all these things happen, the things so that our minds can understand and we could be ready for it. So we give you all praise and honor and glory. In the name of your son, Yeshua, we pray. Hallelujah. Okay, we are <clears throat> going to continue now in Revelation. And we are up to chapter 14. Uh, the last time we did chapter 13, very interesting chapter on the mark of the beast and the 666 and the beast power and all those things. And now, as we start in chapter 14, it says, And I saw and behold the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000, with the name, and uh, some translations have, having his name, and with the name of his father having been written in their foreheads. So, uh, depending on what manuscript you're looking at, some of the manuscripts just say with the name of his father having been written in their forehead. Some of the manuscripts said having his name, Yeshua's name, and the name of his, of his father having been written in their foreheads. So, uh, but what's important here is, as we're getting into chapter 14, remember Revelation 7. We go back there for a minute. Revelation 7. And after these things, I saw four cherubs standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. Nor on the sea, uh, the four winds of the earth, that wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on every tree. And I saw another cherub coming up from the rising of the sun, having a seal of the living Elohim. And he cried to whom? He cried with a loud voice to the four cherubs, to whom it was given to them to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we seal the servants of our Elohim on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those having been sealed. 144,000 having been sealed out of every tribe of the sons of Israel. So this is the same 144,000. Pretty clear about that. And where this magnifies, though, it's showing, number one, where are they? They're standing on Mount Zion, you know, standing on Mount Zion. And they have the name of the Father in their foreheads and maybe the name of Yeshua also in their foreheads. But... One of the things we were talking about when you go to chapter 3, Revelation 3, to the Philadelphian, right? The Philadelphians are the 144,000. And uh, verse 7, to the messenger of the congregation of Philadelphia, right? These things says the Holy One, the True One, the one having the key of David. Where is the key of David? Mount Zion. The one having the key of David, the one opening and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have given a door being opened before you, and no one is able to shut it. For you have a little strength, and you have kept my word, and have not denied my name. So that's one of the big things, and it's really, you know, if you go back just 10, 20 years ago, very, very few people knew the name of Yahweh. Matter of fact, even if you look at the biggest organization, the Worldwide Church of God of the uh, Yahweh's end time remnant in the 20th century. Uh, they never had the name of, of Yahweh in Yeshua, but yet the uh, organization that broke off from their assembly of, of, of Yahweh with uh, Elder C.O. Dodd, he's, he's the one that went with A.B. Trainer and some of these other ones, uh, Elder Snow, and they started understanding the name of Yahweh. But now, in the last 10, 20 years, it's been exploding of people all over the world, of the congregation growing, and all the people that are learning the name of Yahweh. And it's all part of the restoration ministry. You can't have the restoration ministry without the glory going to Yahweh and Yeshua and their real name. And to me, it's sad when you see like some of the old Church of God groups that refuse the name of Yeshua and never had it. But I think what's even more sad to me is people that at one time had the name of Yahweh or had the name of Yeshua. Some of them were even in the congregation with us. And then they leave the congregation and Yahweh takes that name out of their mouth. They don't use that name anymore. <clears throat> Some of them go into Yahua and all other kinds of things. Some of them using Yeshua. Some of them even just going back to Jesus. But, but it's like once they remove themselves 
from uh, Yeshua's congregation and you, the headship in the judicial order, it's really sad to see that they, they wind up even losing his name, like it says here. Uh, let's go to Psalm 125. Psalm 125. <clears throat> One and two, a song of ascents. They who trust in Yahweh shall be like Mount Zion. It shall not, it is not shaken. It remains forever. The mountains are all around Jerusalem, and Yahweh is all around his people from this time and forevermore. So we see the name of our Heavenly Father, the family name of Yahweh, being connected with Mount Zion here. <clears throat> we continue to Psalm 132. Psalm 132, 5 through 7. Until I search out a place for Yahweh, dwellings for the mighty one of Jacob. Lo, we have heard of it at Ephrata. We found it in the fields of the forest. We will enter into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. Drop down to verse 10. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Literally, Messiah. Yahweh has sworn to David in truth. He will not turn away from it. I will set one of the fruit of your body on the throne for you. If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimonies, which I will teach them, their son shall sit on the throne for you forever. Yahweh has, sh- has chosen Mount Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my rest till forever. I will dwell there. I have desired it. Verse 16, and I will clothe her priests Yeshua and her saints shall surely shout. Wow. So here it is. The 144,000 have already fled in, in Revelation 12. And over here, it's saying that they're on Mount Zion is where they are with Yeshua. Uh, I don't know if that's where they're going to be for the whole three and a half years that they're in the wilderness. They, that This might be their ending place. Who knows? But all I know is that they're there. They're with him. And all the things with the tabernacle of David being found and the cornerstone that's there that shows the very covenant that we're part of and that Yahweh has shown that that very stone that was set there by Jacob and was uh, ratified with King David where the Ark of the Covenant stood and Yahweh made this covenant that I just mentioned in Psalm 132 and then he covers over that stone in the tabernacle of David for 3,000 years and now just in the last couple of years it's exposed and now we're seeing this is where the 144,000 are. Wow. How exciting is that, huh? Uh, Joel 3 and verse 9. Yoel. The book of Yoel. Chapter 3 and verse 9. It says, Proclaim this among the nations. Sanctify a war. Awaken the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat their plowshares into swords and their pruning hoods into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Gather yourself and come, all you nations, and gather yourselves together all around. O Yahweh, bring down your mighty ones, right? So here it is. The nations are getting ready for war. Uh, and Yahweh is putting it in there. Verse 13, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down for the press is full. The vats overflow for their wickedness is great. And we're going to see it later in chapter 14. That's what's happening now. The wickedness is reached its full. And Yahweh is comparing it to uh, the ripeness of grapes at the time you're ready to, to harvest them and squeeze the grapes and make the wine. That's what's going to happen with the blood, as we're going to see later in this chapter. Multitudes, multitudes in the Valley of Decision, right? That's the Kidron Valley. For the day of Yahweh is near in the Valley of Decision. The sun and the moon will be darkened and the stars will not gather in their light. And where is Yahweh? Yahweh roars from Mount Zion and gives his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth quake. But Yahweh is a refuge for his people and a fortress to the sons of Israel. And you shall know that I am Yahweh your Elohim, dwelling in Mount Zion, my holy mountain. And Jerusalem will be a holy thing, and no stranger shall no more pass through her. So, <clears throat> this is extremely important in chapter 14, that not only is the 144,000 with Yeshua that there, that it mentions that they are in Mount Zion, and it mentions they have the true name of Yahweh and Yeshua written on their foreheads. What does that mean? We'll get into that shortly. 
Psalm 2 and verse 6. Psalm 2 and verse 6. We see the same thing. Verse 1 says, Why have the nations raged and the people are meditating on emptiness? The kings of the earth have placed themselves, yea, the rulers have plotted together against Yahweh and his Messiah. Right? They plot together. Then verse 6, Yea, I have set my king on my holy mount, on Mount Zion. So, again, Yeshua and Yahweh are two separate, distinct beings. Yeshua is not Yahweh the Father. Yahweh the Father. Yah Yahweh is Yahweh the Father. Yeshua Yahweh is Yahweh the Son. Yahweh being a family name. And that's why the people that are part of that family have that family name written on their foreheads. And that's why that name is extremely important. Uh, Both the Father's name and the Son's name. John 17 and verse 11. John 17 and verse 11. It says, and no longer am I in the world, yet these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, those whom you gave to me, that they may be ikad united as we are ikad united. <clears throat> so clearly, the command is to keep the congregation in the name of the Father, and that's why we're called Congregation of Yahweh. The name of the Father 12 times in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, is the congregation called Congregation of Yahweh. Yahweh, that's there. So, uh, this is how it starts. This is how the chapter is starting. And so, a very, very exciting chapter. We go down to verse 2 now. And I heard a sound out of heaven, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of great thunder. Also, I heard a sound of harpers harping on their harps. Revelation 5, 9, we went over this before. And they sing a new song saying, Worthy are you to receive the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and by your blood you purchased them to Elohim out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So they're over here, these the creatures around the throne of Yahweh. On verse 8 over there of Revelation 5, they have harps and golden bowls of incenses and they're singing a new song about the Lamb of Yah. Worthy is the Lamb. Same thing here. There's great thunder. And he heard a sound of harpers harping on their harps. And they sing a new song. Verse 3. Before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one was able to learn the song except the 144,000. Those having been redeemed from the earth. And that word redeemed literally means to be purchased. You know, it means to be purchased. Where if you think about it right before this, right in, in, in chapter 13, what are we going over? The mark of the beast. And we're saying that if someone doesn't take the mark of the beast in the hand and in the forehead, and I said this last week, the forehead is where you think, the hand is what you do. If you don't take that mark of the beast, you cannot buy and sell. So during this time, believers are not going to be able to buy and sell. And what does Yahweh do to those people? To bless them, he purchases them. He purchases them because they're not purchasing, they're getting purchased by Yahweh himself and Yeshua, of course. And, no, and they, they learned this song that no one is able to learn except 144,000. I don't think in all the Bible, and I've read it many times, I don't think there is a greater blessing that can be bestowed upon a, a human being than to know that song. To think what that means. That, you know, there's 8 billion people on the earth. There's 60 billion people that have ever lived. And that only this unique group, this 144,000 can learn this song of true worship. And I've said this many times. Like I said, I've been in the church system for many, many years. And I saw, and there's people that do special music and not to take away from them, they have beautiful voices or they can play the piano beautifully. And and praise Yahweh for that, that he gives uh, people those kind of gifts. But those gifts are not there to glorify yourself. Those gifts are there to worship him. So it doesn't matter whether you have the worst voice in the world. When you're singing to Yahweh, you're worshiping Yahweh. And this is what this is about. This is about true worship. It's not about people getting worshipped. And that's why normally when we do special music, uh, unless it's it's like a, a natural outburst where people clap, we usually don't clap for it. Because I know 
most people, if they understand it, and I know myself, I don't want to be clapped for it. Because this is the glory is going to Yahweh. And if he gives me uh, a special gift to be able to sing something to him, he gets the glory, not a human being. Because if, if, if you're clapping, the human being is getting the glory, you, you lose your reward. But this verse is talking about true worship. That these, there's true worship. These are people that have the gift of worship. And many people that have the gift of worship do have beautiful voices or they can play instruments, but not always. Because sometimes it's just people happen to have a good voice or play an instrument, but they're not using it to glorify Yahweh. Look at Lucifer, right? Hallel, the, who became Satan the devil. He was the first musician. And he had beautiful music to Yahweh until it got all in his head. And then through the pride and the vanity, even to the point of wanting to go up to the throne of Yahweh, like we read a couple of weeks back, and wanting to, uh, you know, take over the throne of Yahweh, if you can imagine that. In verse 4, okay. These are the ones who had not become defiled, for they are pure. These are the ones following the Lamb wherever he may go. These were redeemed or purchased from among men being the first fruits to Yahweh and to the Lamb. So they are not become defiled and they are pure. So one thing you can imagine, they certainly are not on social media. And it really, it shocks me because I say it so many times. I've given proof. I've sent videos out. And it's even in the, 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 the regular media now. For the last six months, the regular media is saying how Facebook and Twitter and all these things have purposely used this deceitful platform and the algorithms on it to get people addicted like, like gambling halls and all this stuff. And there's brethren that will still stay on it. They'll give an excuse why, but I can tell you one thing. They're not part of the 144,000. Absolutely, 100% they're not. And they'll probably take the mark of the beast and have a reason why it's okay for that too. Well, I really don't want to take it if it was my choice, but this or that, or, you know, I'm a single mother, whatever it might be, there'll be all these kind of excuses. But these are the ones that had not become defiled for they are pure. And the biggest part of defilement, like we keep going back to the Philadelphia experiment, to the Amish and the Mennonites, well... The biggest thing in the world that has kept them undefiled is not having electricity and the things that electricity brings, which is television and internet and DVD players and all of this video games, all of this garbage that is defiling people. And there's a lot of people that are baptized people in, in, uh, out there that have become defiled. They're defiled by the world. And like I said, it's the, it's the worst insult anyone can ever give you is to say, oh, I didn't know you were a believer. You're a believer? Oh, I never knew that. Because that means you're no different than the world. And are we being the examples to the world that they're shamed by what they're doing because they see our good behavior? Or are we acting just like them? So the 144,000, the ones that are with Yeshua on Mount Zion, they have not become defiled because they are pure they are Kodesh. They are not part of the world. Because they're following Yeshua wherever he may go. And you want to know something? If you're a Laodicean, and you're not under any headship in judicial order, because Ephesians 4 is very clear that Yeshua has placed. He said to his disciples that he has placed. He literally ordained 12 apostles who ordained others who ordained others. Because he said, I will not leave you childless. I will not leave you without help. And of course, the Holy Spirit is the biggest help that each of us get when we're baptized. But he also left leadership. And I say this so many times, that if the only reason Yeshua had to come to earth was to pay the penalty of sin, he could have did that in, in the three days, three nights. He didn't need a two to three year ministry to train leadership. And the same way when Moses was told, you're not going into the promised land, what happened? Like a true shepherd, he said to Yahweh, please, ordain somebody to take over for me so that the people are not like sheep without a shepherd. And Yeshua compares his congregation to sheep. And if sheep don't have a shepherd, they're lost, they'll die. And yet the Laodicean thinks they need no headship. They think they can be on their own. They think that, that, that they're going to be fine. And yet they're not because the Bible tells us they think they're rich and increased with goods and need of nothing. That's why they don't think they need headship. But they're poor, they're blind, they're miserable, and naked. So here, these people aren't like that, though. The 144,000, 
They, they are. They follow Yeshua everywhere they go. That means they're following the leaders that Yeshua handpicked. I didn't choose to be here. I didn't choose this way of life. Believe me. I would have been, I, I was already doing when he chose me many, many different things and uh, business and all kinds of stuff, you know, that I was in landscaping, all kinds of stuff that I did before. And Yeshua chose me and I'm trying to be faithful as a leader and as a shepherd to the sheep of Yeshua. But the ones who are following the lamb, wherever he may go, they're following the, the elders and the leaders that Yeshua put there. And these are redeemed. They're purchased from among men, being first fruits to Yahweh and the lamb. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. It says, but now Messiah has been raised from the dead. He became the first fruit of those having fallen asleep. So Yeshua is the first fruit singular. But then in verse 23, but each in his own order, Messiah, the first fruit, afterward those of Messiah at his coming. So Yeshua is the first fruit and we are first fruits at his coming. And that's why you have the feast of first fruit, which is the first day of the week. During Passover, the first Sunday, you know, the only Sunday during Passover week. And then 50 days later, you have the Feast of First Fruits. <laughs> Two different uh, feast days. One is representative of Yeshua and the other is representative of the believers that are coming from his sacrifice. Uh, let's go now to 2 Corinthians 11.2. 2 Corinthians 11.2. He says, for I am zealous over you with the zealousness of Elohim. For I have promised you to one husband to present you a pure virgin to Messiah. That's what it's all about. And it's talking about it spiritual wise. Not that none of these people have ever been married before. But he's talking about people that are pure, that they're not idolatrous. So many times, I'm not going to go into it now. I could do a whole sermon on it. When you look at the nation of Israel and their idolatry to false deities is called fornication or adultery. Very clearly, why? Because they were engaged to Yeshua. They broke they their their uh, fornication caused Yeshua to break the marriage covenant with them. It was never consummated, and that's where they stand. Matthew eight in verse five. Just going over one more time about following the Lamb wherever He goes, because, like I said, I've said in other messages. Sometimes people say. Where is judicial order in the Bible? I've never seen that word. And I say it is everywhere. The whole Bible is... It, it, tell me where judicial order is not placed in the Bible. But this in, is one of the most profound places of judicial order in the New Testament. It's Matthew 5, starting... Uh, Matthew 8, uh, and starting... in verse 5. And Yeshua entering into Capernaum... A centurion came near to him, begging him and saying, Master, my child has been laid in the house, paralyzed and seriously in pain. And Yeshua said to him, I will come and heal him. And answering, the centurion said, Master, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only speak a word and my child will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under myself. And I say to this one, go and he goes, and to another, come and he comes, and to my slave, do this and he does it. And hearing Yeshua marveled. Hearing Yeshua marveled. So here it is. Let's just put this story in perspective. This man is not a Jew. He's not from the tribes. He's a Gentile. He's a centurion, right? He's a soldier. Roman soldier. At this time, the Jews and the Romans hate each other. The Jews are, are looked at as, as just like almost like garbage to Romans. And this is a Roman soldier where other Romans have to bow down to this guy, right? Where like he says, I say to this one, go. And he goes, and I say to this one, come. And yet this soldier understood judicial order so much that he knew, yes, there are people under my authority and I, have, I command them, they have to listen, but I know I'm under others' authority. And people in the military understand that because in the military, you're always under somebody's authority. You know, there's no, you're not the head authority of anything unless you're the president of the United States. He's the commander in chief of the, of the military. But can you imagine that this person says this, that he's not even worthy 
for Yeshua to come in his house because he knows Yeshua is so much greater than him. And this man's saying this as a soldier. And here's Yeshua's answer. It's the greatest example of judicial order, of following leadership, of going in. Look at, what, look at Yeshua's answer in verse 10. And hearing Yeshua marvel, he was, he was shocked. And he said to those following, truly I say to you, not even in Israel did I find such faith. Wow. So he said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? He called this faith. He said it's faith to follow the leadership placed there, right? Because anybody could say, well, hey, it's between me and Yahweh. I don't need anybody. It's between me and Yahweh. But it takes faith to trust in the people that Yahweh put there that are human beings. And like the Bible says, how can you say if you can't love your brother who you have seen, how can you love Yahweh who you've not seen? But I say to you, many will come from the east and the west and will recline with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Yeshua said to the centurion, go as you have believed. Let it be to you. And his child was healed in that moment. So, wow, talk about judicial order. But this is what it's all about. When you're looking at the 144,000 that are redeemed from the earth, they're not part of internet, Facebook, all this other nonsense. And they're not defiled because they're pure. And they follow the lamb wherever he goes. Which means they follow judicial order. They follow the people as long as, of course, it's not blind faith. Each of us still has free will. And if a leader tells you to do something that's unscriptural, of course you're not going to do it. But 99.99% of the time a leader isn't going to tell you to do something unscriptural. So that's the point. You follow the leadership that Yeshua placed. And verse 5, there was no decoy was found in their mouth. For they are unmarked before the throne of Yahweh. So last week, remember, we went over the mark of the beast. Go back to chapter 13. Verse 14. And he deceives those dwelling on the earth because of the signs which were given to do it before the beast, saying to those dwelling on the earth to make an image to the beast who has the wound of the sword and lived. In verse 16. In the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves, it causes that they give to to them all a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads, even though not any could buy or sell except the one having the mark or the name of the beast or the number of its name. And last week I went into that. He talks about computing, computing like a computer, right? Compute the name. It's the number of man, 666. The number three is the number of a, uni a unity number, right? So it's man unified against Yahweh. The six, the gematri is there were no numbers in biblical times, so letters represented numbers. So the gematri, the, the letter value of 666, would be the letter Wav, which is W. W, W, W. Right? Which proves also that the name is Yahweh, not Yahweh, because it's not VVV, it's WWW. You know, it's very clear. That's what it was back then a Wav, not a Vav. So. Amazing that no decoy was found in their mouth where they are unmarked before the throne of Yahweh. So like I said, they're unmarked before the throne of Yahweh. They're not involved in the world system. They're not involved with Facebook and Twitter. They don't have smartphones. They don't have all this stuff. They're out of the world. So they're out of the world. And like I said, because they couldn't buy or sell, Yahweh has purchased them. How fitting, how fitting for that. Psalm 15. Psalm 15. A psalm of David. O oh, Yahweh, who shall sojourn in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell in your holy mountain? Right? That's where we are in, in chapter 14 of Revelation. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his friend. People that are loyal, right? There's loyalty there. Today they look at that as something bad. You know, the president was asking for loyalty from, from some of his cabinet members. They're like, oh, he's looking for he wants loyalty. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Who wouldn't? What, what do you want? You want disloyal people? You want people that are going to stab you in the back? Because that's Satan's way. No. He does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his friend. This, the people that are there are people that are loyal. And if you're loyal to Yeshua, you're going to be loyal to the people Yeshua put. In the book of John, Yeshua said, if they believe me, they'll believe you. If they follow me, they'll follow you. And it's that simple, that the true sheep of Yeshua are going to follow the people that he put there. He says, Nor he lifts up a reproach against his neighbor. In his eyes, the reprobate has been despised, but he honors those who fear Yahweh. He has sworn to his hurt, 
and he will not change it. So again, he keeps his word. It's not that only when it's convenient, only when it benefits him. No, the the 144,000, the ones who are on Mount Zion, are the ones who keep their word to their own hurt, even if it's costing them. So let's go on to the next uh, verse here, verse 6. And I saw another cherub flying in mid-heaven, and with blood having the everlasting good news to proclaim to those dwelling on the earth, even to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. So if you remember, there was a eagle flying, you know, remember he, it, with uh, uh, blood a couple of chapters ago. Here you see a cherub flying in mid-heaven with blood having the everlasting good news. Matthew twenty four fourteen. Matthew twenty four fourteen. and this good news of the kingdom will be published in all the earth for a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come and and praise Yahweh that we're part of that I don't think just what we're doing is fulfilling that scripture but what we are doing is fulfilling that scripture we are part of that as well as other branches of Yahweh's congregation are and ultimately this cherub who's flying in mid heaven will be the one finishing this that was in uh, Matthew twenty four fourteen, Saying, so he's flying in mid-heaven. He's proclaiming the good news to proclaim to those dwelling in the earth, even to every nation and tribe and language and people. So the same way as the beast power is a world government all over the earth. And now the word of Yahweh and Yahweh's congregation is going all over the earth. And I, I, I've written to the brethren, I was saying this, that in the last couple of years, just since the Shemitah, it has just been unbelievable uh, how many thousands upon thousands of people you always call to our congregation. And, you know, calls from all over the earth. And, you know, and it says when the gospel, when the good news goes in the furthest part of the earth and, the, and will come, I went to the furthest part of the earth. I went to Papua New Guinea and they say that. Now that Papua New Guinea got the good news, the end can come. And you see hundreds of people there. You see thousands of people all over Africa. And like I said, we can't even keep up with it. Even with all the elders we have and the, the, the good servants that Yahweh has working with me, we just can't keep up with it. You know? And it's not like before where you're getting one person here, you know, one in a family, two in a city. Here we're getting full congregations, sometimes full churches, pastors, hundreds of people even in the thousands all coming to faith at the same time which sometimes has problems of itself, but it's part of the prophecy that this good news is going into all the earth. Verse 7, saying in a great voice, Fear Elohim and give glory to him, because the hour of his judgment is come. Also worship him who has made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. Worship him who made creation, right? Exodus 20 and verse 11. Exodus 20 and verse 11. Because people will say, you don't have to keep the Shabbat in the New Testament, and that's Old Testament, that's part of the ceremony of law, and it's nonsense, because it's part of the Big Ten. You don't get bigger in, 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 in the Bible what is part of Yahweh's character than the Ten Commandments. And if Yahweh didn't want the Sabbath in there, they'd be the Nine Commandments. But they're not. They're the Ten Commandments, because the Sabbath is an integral part of his family and his congregation, and it's a very sign of being a family member. We know that from Exodus 31, but right now I'm going to go to Exodus 20, verse 11. And what does it say? I'll start in verse 10. And the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your Elohim. You shall do no work, your son, and all the people in your house, your daughter, your slave girl. In verse 11, four and six days, Yahweh made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all which is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. On account of this, Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified, he set it apart. So when we see over here, this everlasting cherub saying, fear Elohim and give glory to him because the hour of his judgments come and worship him who's made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all the springs of water. He's definitely talking about Shabbat. He's talking about give him the honor on the seventh day. In verse 8, and another cherub followed, saying, The great city Babylon has fallen, has fallen, because the wine of the anger of her fornication she made all the nations drink. And a uh, few weeks we'll be getting into Babylon itself. We'll be having probably at least one, probably two Bible studies on Babylon, Revelation 17 and 18. So I won't go into much here. I'll just read Revelation 18, verse 2 and verse 10, because that'll be a whole chapter in itself. But Revelation 18, verse 2. 
And he cried with a strong, great voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, it is fallen. It has become a dwelling place with those possessed by demons, and a home of every foul spirit, and a home of every unclean bird, even the home of every unclean and hateful beast. Drop down to verse 10. Standing from afar because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe to the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment came. So that's what's happening, and we'll see when we get there to Revelation 17 and 18, Babylon isn't just getting destroyed. What's happening is Babylon is being remembered before Yahweh. So again, the book of Revelation is in chronological order, but sometimes we're overlapping because it's saying this goes on for three years, but something else in the next chapter is also going on during that time. So it's overlapping that way. But this cherub is saying that Babylon has fallen, And verse 9, and a third cherub followed, saying in a great voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark in his forehead or in his hand, he also shall drink of the wine of the anger of Yahweh, having been mixed undiluted in the cup of his wrath. And he will be tormented by fire and brimstone before the holy cherubs and before the lamb. So, wow. So this is pretty serious that uh, Yahweh is... Not playing games here. He's very serious. People want to make excuses for everything. But whoever takes the mark of the beast. Well, would he want me to starve to death? Yes. If that's what it takes in that time. And you want to know something? If you had faith in him to begin with. And you simply prepared for these times that are coming. You wouldn't be starving to death. Because I know that people will be starving to death in the kibbutzes and the communities. That Yahweh is creating for his congregation. We just need the faith now to start acting out what we believe. And this is what's happening here. But if somebody does take that mark, wow, wow, you're done, like it says. Yahweh having been mixed, he he will drink the wine of the anger of Yahweh being mixed, undiluted in the cup of his wrath, and he will be tormented by fire and brimstone before the cherubs and before the land. And the smoke of her torment will rise forever and ever. And those worshipping the beast in its image have no rest day and night, even if anyone receives the mark of its name. So it's, wow, that's something uh, that you wouldn't want. (laughs) I know recently I've had a problem with my shoulder. I've had problems sleeping. And it's very hard when you can't sleep. It's hard to do your work during the day when you can't sleep at night. But that's, you know, everything in this life is short. You know, it's only a short period of time. And then that's it. You know, whether you're healed, you have operation like me or whatever. uh, It it comes over. But here, he says, and those worshiping the beast in its image have no rest day and night, even if anyone receives the mark of the name, that that's it. You're going to the lake of fire and you're going to cease to exist. Verse 12. But here is the patience of the saints. And literally that word is sanctified ones. The Kodesh ones, the set-apart ones. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are the ones keeping the commandments of Elohim and the faith of Yeshua. So they're keeping the commandments of Elohim and the faith of Yeshua. Revelation 22, 14. Revelation 22 and verse 14. Blessed are the ones doing His commandments, for their authority will be over the tree of life. And that they may enter by the gates into the city. So very, very clearly, here are the ones. These are the 144,000, right? And who are they? This is the patience of the set-apart ones. They're the ones keeping the commandments of Elohim. And they have the faith of Yeshua. It's that simple. So anybody out there, uh, Christian pastors or anybody that's saying the law is nailed to the cross and they don't have to be obedient and you don't have to follow the commandments, you are not part of this group. It's that simple. If you go to 1 John, 1 John 2 and verse 3. By this we know that we have known him, Yeshua, if we keep his commandments. The one saying I have known him and not keeping his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in that one. But whoever keeps his word, truly this one, in this one, the love of Yahweh has been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. So, you know, you could say what you want. People could say the name of Yahweh or Yeshua isn't important. People could say the Sabbath isn't important. People could say you could eat pork. It doesn't make a difference. It's only food. But at the end of the day, all that human reasoning is going to get you 
is a one-way ticket down the slide into the lake of fire. <laughs> That's it. And you know, it's, 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 a one, it's a one-way pass. Once you go down that slide, you're not coming back. Because if you go by the, 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 the scriptures, and that's why I think my book, The Great Falling Away, has been so powerful for almost 20 years now. Because the scriptures don't lie. And I have had thousands. We did seven printings of the book already. Thousands upon thousands of people that have contacted me, including pastors and priests and other people, even rabbis, that have looked at that book and have said, wow, it's true. The scripture has convicted them to come to the truth. So if, if these, some of these Baptist pastors out there or these uh, whatever they are, you know, uh, evangelical pastors, if they don't want to obey the commandments, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. The one saying I've known him and not keeping his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So, so you can argue with yourself till you're blue in the face. And that includes the third commandment of the name of Yahweh and Yeshua and the fourth commandment that's his, that includes his Sabbath day. As well as the other ones. Not leaving, if you leave your spouse and marry another, it's adultery. No adultery will be in the kingdom. You know, so we have to keep all the commandments of Yahweh, except the ceremonial law. The Levitical priesthood that was added, I'm going to talk about this at Sukkot. Of course, that's been fulfilled because it was something that is not even part of the original Tanakh or Torah. And it was added later. So that is, has been fulfilled, but that's a different story. But very clearly, the ones who are the 144,000, the sanctified ones, the, the, the ones, the Kodesh ones, the ones that are set apart, are keeping the commandments of Yahweh. Verse 13, And I heard a voice out of heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead, the ones dying in the Master from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they shall rest from their labors, and their works will follow them. So, this is at a point now where the bowls are getting ready to come, 90% or more of the earth are going to die. And Yahweh is saying from this point on, blessed are the dead, the ones dying in the master. There's no need to live from this point on. Because it's only Yahweh coming with his cherubs to burn up and purify the earth. And then his people will be resurrected anyway. So this is a point where how long this is going to take, we don't know. It might be a year, you know, give or take. So you could sleep in the earth and rest during that time. You don't need to be here while... That's happening. But Revelation 22 and verse 12 says, And behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to give each according to his work. So again, you could say what you want. You could say what you think Yahweh says or doesn't say. At the end of the day, he tells us what he says. If you really think about it, beside the Bible, name a book that is uh, that goes back 6,000 years and was actually written almost 4,000 years ago. Name any book in the world. Find me a book that is that old. There might be some things that are some hieroglyphics that are small things. This is a book here. Our Bible is 1,562 pages and has everything in there. Nothing has been lost. So you have something that's going back to the beginning of creation. That's 6,000 years of history and was written more than 3,500 Closer to, to uh, 36, 3,700 years ago. And it's all preserved. So Yahweh preserved it for us, right? And all we have to do is follow. And verse 14 now. Verse 14. And I saw and behold a white cloud. And on the cloud one sitting like the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. So this is Yeshua now. This is Yeshua's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Uh, the cherubs have the balls, but he's, he's the one who's bringing it. He's the, the leader of the, the heavenly army of Yahweh, like we saw when, when the messenger of Yahweh, Yeshua, uh, appeared before uh, uh, Balaam, and he appeared before uh, Yehoshua, and others, you know, with, with Gideon's uh, mother. And this is him now. He's the messenger of Yahweh. And he's riding on a cloud. And the, the son of man having a golden crown. And in his hand a sharp sickle. So there's a sickle in his hand. Why? Because it's harvest time. But yet, if you go back to Revelation 6. In verse 2. Many people misinterpret this as being Yeshua when it's not. Revelation 6 says... 
And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and the one sitting on it had a bow. And a crown was given to him, and he went out overcoming, and that he might overcome. No, this is the anti-Messiah, right? The first thing Yeshua tells us in the end, before he tells us about all the stuff in Revelation, he says, watch for deception. Very first thing. That there'll be false signs and false wonders and false prophets that, if possible, would even deceive the elect, which is kind of scary. So in Revelation 6, it's the anti-Messiah. But here now, it's the real one that's coming. Verse 15. And another cherub went forth out of the sanctuary, crying in a great voice to the one sitting on the cloud, saying, Send your sickle and reap, because your hour to reap came, because the harvest of the earth was dry. So here it is, uh, the book of Yoel, 3.13. Book of Yoel, 3.13. says, Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. And where is this multitude? Multitudes in the Valley of Decision. For the day of Yahweh is near in the Valley of Decision. You know, the Kidron Valley. Valley of Jehoshaphat, same valley there. So what we see here is, right, that uh, the harvest is ready. And he's saying, putting your sickle, the whole book of Joel is about this time here in the end. And verse 15, or no, we did verse 15. Let, let's just go one of the scripture, Matthew 13 and verse 39. Matthew 13 and verse 39. And this is the, you know, he's talking about the uh, parable, you know, with the the field where the man comes and he's putting bad seed and then he's telling what it is, you know, and he says the field is the world and the good seed. These are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the evil one. I said this many times. If you just go by Yeshua's own words, 50% of the people that are in the congregation are tares. They're not real believers, you know. And that's coming from himself. The goats and the and the sheep and the wheats and the tares. And the enemy who sown them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age. And the cherubs are the reapers. Then as the tares are gathered and consumed in the fire, so will be in the completion of the sun, the completion of this age. The son of man will send forth his cherubs and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who practice lawlessness. They will throw them into the furnace of fire. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine out like the sun in the kingdom of their father, the one having ears to hear. So this is what we're up to now. This is where these cherubs are going to go, and they're going to bring these people to the lake of fire. And it, the ironic part is, they've been told all the time of this false rapture. And many of these lawless people are going to think they're being taken in a rapture, but they're actually going to be taken to the lake of fire. Because, you know, we know there is no pre-tribulation rapture. That's not something we see in Scripture. Uh, And unfortunately, they didn't listen, and that's what's going to happen. Verse 16, And the one sitting on the cloud thrust his sickle into the earth, and the earth was reaped. Just like we're reading before in Joel and in Matthew. So it's, it's, he's poetically saying this, using hyperbole, that he's sticking his, he's reaping his sickle in the earth, and what's happening and another cherub went forth out of the sanctuary in heaven he also having a sharp sickle and another cherub went forth from the altar having authority over the fire and he spoke with a great cry to the one having the sharp sickle saying send your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth because its grapes are ripened wow so this is where we see here uh, that literally it's happening you know, these people are being, uh, their life is being taken because it's, it's the wickedness that's there and the lawlessness that's there. And the cherub thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw into the winepress of the great anger of Yahweh. If you go to uh, Revelation 19.15... It says, And out of his mouth goes a, forth a sharp sword... That with it he might smite the nations, and he will shepherd them with an iron rod, talking about the Messiah, and he treads the winepress of the wine of the anger and the wrath of Yahweh Almighty. Yahweh is not happy with this earth. 
He's not happy at all of the sin that's going on in the world. He's not happy at all the homosexuality. He's not happy at all the divorce. He's not happy at all the lying and, and, and just evil stuff that's going on in this earth. He's not happy at all the false worship. He's not happy at this. And now this is the time that people are going to reap what they sow. You know, they're going to reap what they sow. And this is what's, uh, what's happening here. It says, And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood went out of the wine press as far as the bridles of the horses. You know where the bridle is on the horse. That's up at, 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 at the mouth. From a thousand six hundred furlongs. Bridle high. You know how much blood that is? Figure it out. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood went outside of the wine press as far as the bridle of the horses from a thousand six hundred furloughs. That's a hundred and eighty miles by four and a half feet of blood. A hundred and eighty miles by four and a half feet of blood. That's almost the whole length of, of, of the nation of Israel, you know, at least to the Gaza Strip down there. All out. All out. Like four and a half feet of blood. And one thing is 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 as eerie as that sounds, blood does purify. You know, it says there is no forgiveness without blood. And the blood will literally purify the land for the millennium, for the growing and everything. So uh, Isaiah 63, Isaiah 63 in verse 1. We see this here. But that is a lot of blood. That is a lot of blood. Who is this who comes from Edom with crimson garments from Basra, right? So who's coming? This is, this is in modern-day Jordan, where Basra is. That's in the southern part of the land there. And it says, who is this coming with red garments? One adored in his clothing, inclining in great power. And then who is it? And the person speaks. It is I, to speak in righteousness, the great Yeshua. So he literally names himself who he is. Why is your clothing red and your garments like one who treads in the wine press? I have tread in the wine press. I alone and no man of the people was with me. And I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury. And their juice shall be spattered on my garments. And I will pollute all my clothes. For the day of vengeance is on my heart. And the year of my redeemed has come. The Jubilee year. So wow, you couldn't get any clearer. But this is clearly talking about what we're go- what's going on right here. And we already read Joel 3.13. Maybe I'll just read it one more time. Joel 3 and verse 13. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down for the press is full. The vats overflow for their wickedness is great. Multitude, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of Yahweh is near in the valley of decision. Verse 12 says, Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations around. So, wow, we're looking at the day of Yahweh. And as we get into chapter now, verse 15 and 16, we're going to see uh, the bowls coming out, horrible things that come from there. Then we're going to reflect back. He says, then we're going to think back about Babylon and Revelation 18 and 19. And then uh, Revelation 17 and 18, rather, Revelation 19 will be about uh Yeshua's return, which is here. You know, then we're going to continue in the story. In Revelation 20, the millennium, 21 and 22, the new heavens and the new earth, and Yahweh coming to that earth. So, uh, well, we got, we got a few more studies to go of really this horror, but then it's really great. And like somebody said one time, I read the book, in the end we win. <laughs> you know, so as horrible as this time's going to be, as as bad as this time is going to be, as bad as it is right now in the world, we've read the book. We're looking at it. Read Revelation 21, 22, if ever you're feeling down about it, because in the end we win. But what hasn't been determined is, what side are you going to be on? Are you going to be on that side of the 144,000 following the Lamb wherever he goes and surrendering your will to the will of Yahweh and the will of his people and community? Or is your, are you going to be a Laodicean and keep your own will and do your own thing and kid yourself that you're spiritual and do all these other things? Like I said, over the years we met 
hundreds and hundreds of people in Israel. And they come there. They think they're important. Yahweh sent them there. They have to be there. If they leave, Yahweh will kill them. And they got to run up and touch a wall. And they got to do this prayer at this place. And it's all nonsense. It's all people trying to bring self-importance to themselves. Vanity of vanity is all is vanity. It has nothing to do with Yahweh. You know, pure religion is this. It's to help the, 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 the widow and the orphan and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's pure religion. You want to say Yahweh's leading you? Then start a ministry of going to hospitals and praying with people, holding their hand, encouraging them. Start a ministry of going to orphanages and visiting children and spending time with them. Start one of these ministries of helping widows, you know, and visiting them and taking care of them. But don't tell me how important you are because Yahweh's speaking to you and he wants you to touch a wall somewhere where he's commanding you to go somewhere because we call that Jerusalem syndrome. These are people that are, uh, they're just, they're, they're not right. They're probably being led by demons. And uh, we are the real thing here. This is the real thing. You don't have to go in that direction. We have the real thing. Yahweh is truly working with us. He, he's showing the signs from heaven. We saw the great sign last year, the Revelation 12 sign. He's revealed uh, to the congregation through me, the sign of the tabernacle of David. I mean, he's shown so many things to us that are true. We don't have to start making false things up to make ourselves more important. You want to know something? If we're really spiritual, we need to, at this time, be humbling ourselves and to be giving Yahweh all the glory and to be loving our neighbor as ourself and to be really preparing for this time that is very cl close and around the corner. So, wow, another great Bible study. And the next time, Revelation chapter 15. Shabbat Shalom.